quite, quite the beard drop that came out today. We've got Joey Sanchez here, and he's with At The Boulevard. So first of all, let me explain the way I understand uh, At The Boulevard. It's a place where car enthusiasts everywhere can get together. They can be passionate, they can talk about their experiences and their stories, and they can really just gel together. So you guys are creating the largest um, driver and riders club in the world. Tell me about this app. Man, it's just awesome. It's a beautiful thing. If you love rides, this is the place to hang out and talk about your ride, showcase your ride. And one of the things that we do here at the Boulevard, it's all about the driver. The rider on the street bike, the guy that builds his car in the garage for about, you know, three years before he pulls it out. And that's what we're all about. Nice. Okay, so, so it's actually an app people can download. You have yeah. it in, yeah, you have it in the Android, Android and iPhone. It's called The Boulevard, the BLVD. Right, yeah, so make sure you guys get the BLVD down. It's got the abbreviation. That's the yeah. website, too. So at the BLVD.com, at the Boulevard. You guys are also on Twitter, at the Boulevard. Instagram, and then, every one of the social places, at the Boulevard. Yeah, and I was playing with this app before. So you're, I'm guessing you're a big car guy, right? Did you put your own exhaust and like lift and all that stuff? <laughs> no, I, actually, I'm more a tech guy. We're a startup here in oh, Las Vegas. Yeah. So the tech scene for me was looking for a niche that had a $2 billion kind of cap in it and take a niche in it because right now the, the auto industry is very stagnant. us. Fragmented, there you go. <laughs> and so we picked a niche and right now what is really riding out more this whole summer was the imports. The import guys are loving us, they're downloading the app and we show up at every, every show that's been on the West Coast, we've been there showcasing the app. And people have been downloading and giving us good uh, feedback. Okay, well, we'll get our audience tweeting at you. So that's All at right. the Boulevard. We appreciate you coming out. Thank you so much for paying appreciate for the you. beer. Give him a big round of applause. We appreciate you, Joey. <laughs>
but I naturally thought of her. She was just a natural fit for the, right. the hosting portion of it. So, um, you know, when I asked her, she was like, yeah, I'm, I'm all in. So, you know, it just took off from there. And she's extremely funny. I mean, but she's so natural, you know. So a lot of people really, she has a good following, too. So a lot of people come just to, you know, just to check her out. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I do. So next we have Matt, and he's from Strip and Dip. Now, Strip and Dip will come in before uh, toting beer and food, which has been awesome. And again, you've brought in your chicken and your macaroni cheese and your veggies again tonight. Our audience is happily munching on that now. So thank you very much. Um, but you're here to talk about your fundraiser, right? right. Um, it's extremely um, exciting to partner up with uh, Hero School, which um, for us, our team is very passionate about uh, wanting to do something to make a difference in our community, bring the community together. Um, so the announcement is that um, on Tuesday, September 10th, we are offering a, basically a one two piece meal per person for free. So basically, it's going to be free food, ex uh, you know, exchange for donations. It's a minimum of four dollars. All that, the minimum, all the money that we make will be donated to Hero School to make an impact for our community and um, just to show people how to, you know, to be involved and to support and um, also just bringing the community together and making donations. Excellent. It's a wonderful cause too. Tell me a bit more about this this Hero School that you're supporting. Um, the Hero School was, um, I believe, founded by Tiger Todd, which. Um, to learn more about it, uh, it basically helps people with disadvantages that are homeless, and you know, being able to help help them and give them um, give them a guidance and just give them an opportunity and show that you know people do care. I believe you know we're all born with the same opportunity, and it's just nice to be able to make people like, give, you know give a good difference. That's excellent. We love it when local companies give back to the community. Yeah. So thank you so much. Again, what was that date and how? Uh, it's on. If you guys want to get your calendars out, um, it's Tuesday, September 10th, from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. And again, um, every donation counts. Um, we are looking to give people a good future and to get back and get them back on their feet. <laughs> Fantastic, so I'll be down there and I'll be eating my chicken but also making a difference. So thank yeah, you so every much. single dollar. Thank you guys so much for having yeah. me. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Yeah. focus more on the music scene around Vegas, which is super exciting. So we'll be talking about some of the live bands that we'll be playing in September, and yeah, it's going to be really cool. Right, okay, so raise your hand. you guys like home cooking? Anybody that's into home cooking, raise your hand. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Vast majority, vast majority. Perfect. <laughs> so we're the first live band not cooking show that we're going to be talking about is called Home Cooking, so I think we might have... It's a band. I don't know. Same word. <laughs> So maybe they, they play and they cook at the same time. That'd be pretty cool, right? Pro probably, yeah. <laughs> Think about food. So this brass ensemble called Home Cooking uh, is going to be playing at Triple B on First Friday. So again, that's the 6th of September for First Friday. So you can basically come and get some food and some drink. And at 11 p.m. they're going to start playing. There is no cover, but it is for ages 21 and up. And yeah, the Brass Ensemble is really cool, and I love their name for Cook, and it is very cool, so make sure you get down for that. It's going to be fun. All right, so everybody, I don't know if you've ever, this might remind you if anybody got any guitars, but you guys ever had that dream where you were just on stage, like rocking out, and you pushed your foot up on the amp, and you just let the devil take over your fingers, you know, like rip that, rip that chord? <laughs> Anyone? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of sounds like an 80s rock band or an 80s rock star. <laughs> Dylan, that's probably more your style, but Darwin Dees, who's going to be playing at the beauty bar, is kind of more of an inventor than an 80s rock star. So Darwin Dees has invented his own four-string guitar, which is really cool. He's got this secret tuning on it. So this is an experience you want to go to, you're going to want to get down to. It's not your typical tuning. So he invented this guitar himself. He plays a live set with original songs, including electronic noise and bouts of synchronized dancing. 
synchronized dancing sound to be I'm super excited. The date is going to be September the 14th, and once again, that's at the Beauty Bar at 11 p.m. You can get pre-sale tickets on Ticket Cake for $12, but if you don't quite get there in time and you feel like going down there on the day, it's only $15 at the door. So Se yeah, awesome. secret tuning, four strings, guy's an inventor. It I mean, sounds unmissable. Yeah. I'm really excited to see this event. I'm definitely going to get down for that. The next one coming up is Moving Units at Artifice on September the 28th, and you can get tickets for that as well on Ticket Cake. Just for some background, Moving Units are super um, big on the touring scene, so they've covered for bands like Pixies, Blur, Hot Hot Heat, and Interpol, which is very cool. And in 2006, they actually opened for Nine Inch Nails, which is really, really cool. So get down there, it's only $15 for Ticket Cake, and it's at Artifice, which is a super cool place downtown to see them play. And that's gonna be on September 28th. Now the, the next person we're going to be speaking to is Corey Henderson. We're welcoming him back. I'm oh, sorry, welcoming him back. Now last time we had you here, we actually set a world record. What was the record? Yeah, we got the record for the most people in a room acting like barnyard animals. Right. So you have to talk with Boz or Moose or whatever your chosen animal was, and it was that yeah, was awesome. You were the coolest. <laughs> but we teased him a little bit because he didn't bring his, he didn't bring your jacket. Yeah, no. Next time I will absolutely bring it. Yeah, but that is your signature thing. I'm it's like not Batman not going around. <laughs> okay. So uh, you've got some live music coming up at an event of yours, which is how we've tied this in. Why don't you tell us about what's going on? Sure. So you know, for those who don't know, we're we're sort of the new world record people in, on the scene. We're we're hoping to be the the new yeah home for world records. Get out of your Guinness. Out with the Guinness and with the record setter. Yeah. So so we. Um, we actually had a long-running series in New York that we've been doing of the live events um, that we called Record Center Live, and we are now bringing that here to downtown Las Vegas. So next Thursday the 5th, um, Learning Village, free event. We're going to be seeing probably 10 to 12 um, performers doing world records live on stage, and you know, the, I wish I could preview what they are, but there's no way to tell. We've had, you know, some of our classic records from in New York. We had Andrew W.K. sing the uh, record for the most time sang party in a song. So that oh, was, yeah. She heard about that before I knew like that. <laughs> but you could see the fastest time to open a bit, um, can of Campbell's soup and spell pantyhose. Oh! <laughs> could be something like that. Yeah. We, don't we don't know. We don't know. We, and we, we still have a few slots for people that if they want to set records, let us know. Send us an email. I wonder whether we'll see them doing things with his invention. That would be awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any, anybody in the audience have, have you guys, anybody in the audience have a record they want to set at this event? Okay, all right. Well, thank you so much for coming out and hanging out with us. We check out recordcenter.com. Excellent. And that's the new thing to see. Thanks. Thanks. to have one of Fortune's 2012 Top 10 Most Powerful Women Entrepreneurs with us. She built Provident Trust, which has helped over 40,000 clients and handles over $4 billion in client assets. And today we're going to talk to her and try to deconstruct some of this story to find out what really it was like to be going from an independent entrepreneur to this high stakes mega shark that you've become now. So I want everyone to please put their hands together for our local superstar, the one and only Teresa Confetti. If you Google confetti, it'll still come up, but actually, okay. <laughs> so, all right, so let's start up. So how many of these worthless maggots did you have to crush to build your empire? Uh, no, no, probably none. <laughs> oh, none, okay. No, it's probably actually uh, one of our core values is that you don't have to step on anybody's head to become successful. No, oh, okay. So I think maybe that's why it just took us a little, well, most people would say that our success was fast, but it took us a little longer than we had hoped because when you do things the right way, it takes time. 
Okay, well, we talk a lot about culture in this community, especially kind of coming from Zappos, a lot of people coming from Zappos and it being so close. So tell me about your specific culture and really what that was like. So people call us the Zappos of the financial world, which oh. is kind of an oxymoron a little bit. Uh, so we let our, our staff wear t-shirts and jeans and flip-flops and we let them be who they are. They can decorate their cubicles how they want. It's not as crazy as Zappos because I don't know how you get work done with things like that. Right. Um, but we also believe that the employees have the best ideas. So they're the ones that establish, you know, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So this year they picked, they wanted a chef to come in every week um, to cook them lunch a couple times a week. We had a yoga specialist coming in at seven o'clock in the morning um, doing all these crazy yoga moves with people. We did like a boot camp together. Cool. Uh, so my staff is a lot of fun. It's, a, it's one big family, I think. Okay, so tell me how people like who are sort of down the chain in some sense or disconnected from like the main core people actually get messages back. Because, you know, I always hear about the like, you know, you get to dress how you want or you want, you know, like make your desk with like some funny stuff. But really, how do you get a message when somebody has like a little idea or wants a quirky little fun thing? for everyone like how do they approach you do you just let them walk in or so for an organization i think to work like that you can't have a top-down type of atmosphere we definitely have hierarchy and the ceo and you have managers and things like that um, but people can't be afraid to bring their ideas so if you create an, an environment of fear and an environment of uh, you know where they come with their ideas and then you smash them down every single right. time you're not going to get them but if you create this environment where they want to bring them they will so it took, that takes time. You don't do that overnight. People are still scared to tell you that they want to wear flip-flops to work. Yeah. You know, and it took them almost a year to finally say, we really <laughs> don't want to wear, you know, business casual. Oh, really? So they were, like, talking about it. They are like, should we tell her we, we just don't want to wear business casual? And yeah. then they finally came. And how'd you, how'd you take it? All right? You're just like, that's it? Well, I, I think I'm the only want. CEO that wears a, a full-on suit with flip-flops under my desk. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so tell me an example. What's one of the best uh, stories where somebody came up and, and suggested something to you that you probably wouldn't have thought of on your own or you think has really helped the culture? Um, so probably the, the yoga teacher was the best one, not because of the yoga, but he happened to be this, like, spiritual healer type person. Yeah, I know that. And we were having some changes. <laughs> <You know? Okay. laughs> changes in our culture and it wasn't blending well and this guy you know the yoga was the, the side of it. his name was Martin Hinton and he ended up being what caused our culture to come back together oh, um, cool. and people were crying during the middle of their yoga hugging after yoga it was pretty crazy um, but I think when your culture is open to change like that and uh, the healing can happen and and we can move forward from that so yeah yeah awesome I love that story okay so let's talk about some of the uh, big factors in your success I mean you have, you have by all means a gigantic company that you're in charge of now but I'd like to hear more about a lot of the entrepreneurs in this audience are kind of raising the first like one to five hundred thousand dollars and kind of putting the core team together but let's try to deconstruct some of this success back to where it started and like how can people replicate it or what are some of the key things that stick out in your mind so I uh, just gave a speech on the Zuckerberg effect I call it um, I, I I've coined this, this term because I find that when I'm talking to young entrepreneurs, especially in this day and age, they're saying, you know, I have this great idea and I'm going to make a billion dollars and it's so awesome and I'm going to raise all this money and they raise like $10 million and then they lose it and they wear it like a badge of courage. Um, they, losing other people's money was fun for them. Um, and I, I'm trying to mentor some of the young entrepreneurs that I mentor. Um, I'm trying to get them back to the basics that if you make a million dollars and you get to bring home two or three hundred thousand of it, that's just as much a badge of courage as losing ten million dollars of somebody uh, else's gotcha. money. So to start with the core foundation, start with core values, do the right things, build your business on real principles. Um, I, I notice in, in some of the, the startup companies, it's all fluff. It's all about, you know, they want to say culture, but you got to build the culture after you have substance. Right. You got to you got to be selling something that people want, either a service or a product, right? If you're yeah. not selling something that people want, then you're probably going to blow up in a couple years. So do you, yeah, exactly. So I mean, do you correlate it to like do you think slow growth is like a positive or negative, or is that just a null factor? Are you uh, really just all about so if, if there's good revenues or? Good so growth? we didn't have slow growth. I mean, in in comparison to other companies, um, uh, people would say that our growth was really rapid, but it was the right growth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I don't think it's anything, it's almost like people would cry if you made a five million, if you made five million in revenue and you actually got to bring home two million, that was, 
you know, not good enough, you had to make a billion and lose 400 million. So I, I don't know if you guys have been right. watching, you know, the, the NASDAQ and Facebook and all that kind of crazy stuff. You know, they're, they're making crazy money, but they're losing it too. No, I, I So, you know, it. It, it's great to see the young entrepreneurs build strong businesses because our communities need strong businesses, strong leaders. They don't need a bunch of fluff. Right. That's what I believe, so. You haven't told anyone from San Francisco this, have you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did? Okay. I think I'm not allowed there. Okay. <laughs> it's good. Okay, well, I definitely like that model. I think I think you're actually 100 right. So let's talk about um, some of your thoughts about the entre entrepreneurial community that's actually downtown in Las Vegas right now. So what do you think about maybe the downtown project and the community down here, but maybe in the state as a large, either one of those opinions would be so fascinating to me. I think in Vegas alone, what is happening here is really exciting, and I think what Tony Shea has created in downtown is super exciting. He's bringing all these young entrepreneurs who are passionate and hungry to our city who's a little bit sleepy. Um, so it's really great to, to see the energy coming into Vegas as well as Vegas has always been kind of lacking of talent. So people come in and when you do something well, everybody wants you because right. there's just not enough of you. And uh, what the downtown project is doing is bringing really good, talented young people that people like me want to hire. Right. So we're really excited about what's happening in downtown. Okay, so, so you're like, in a nutshell, you're just excited that there's kind of this new energy, like kind of a youthfulness that's coming in? Yeah, yeah. I think every city needs that. And I think to rebuild our economy, that's what we need as well. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a bit of, well, actually, you know what I'm kind of curious about is, so if you do get successful to a pretty high extreme, can you walk me through kind of like your internal dialogue, like, you know, you're, you're going after this goal, like you want to make revenues, like you want to grow a company, and then at some point you must have said, ah, you know, I've really like accomplished what I wanted to at first, and of course you could like move that bar back and like keep going for it, but tell me how your mindset changed, or like maybe how your values might have changed, like what became important at the point when you realized like this is a success? Um, that just happened about three or four weeks ago. So oh. I was sitting in an entrepreneurs group meeting and uh, one of my best friends, Jason Griffith, owns one of the largest regional firms here in town. We were going around the table saying, what is our next level? And I said, it's to build a hundred million dollar company. And he looked me straight in the face and said, it's bullshit. And I was like, what? I'm gonna build a hundred million dollar company. How could you not say that? That's yeah. my next level. And he said, that's bullshit. You're gonna build that with your eyes closed. Oh, okay, what are you sure. really going to do to take yourself to the next level? And it caused me to go home and my mind was spinning and it's still spinning from this conversation. Well, what did you mean? More money? Or like, it meant like you need more happy? It's, like, uh, it's not about money. Built, so at this point, like, you know, I, I'm at a point of success and it's not about the next level of money. It's yeah. about the next level of being maybe a hundred million dollar person. And so now I'm really looking at myself and, and myself as a mom and, and a person in the community and all these things and you know, am I contributing a hundred million dollars of value to my children, to my community, not just to my business? Yeah. Um, am I building core values in my family? Am I, am, am I bringing all this stuff that I do and drive at work home? Yeah. And I'm probably not. So that's my journey this year is I'm going to work on becoming a hundred million dollar person. Um, and uh, I, I ha I'm happy that he made me see that that was kind of a cop out. Yeah, well, let, let's go a little further on that. Cause so, I mean, I understand um, maybe it's not money, but tell me what's going on with your internal dialogue. Like, is now all of a sudden, like, do you have a daughter? Is it? Do you have a kid? Two sons. Two yeah. sons. Okay. So, like, if one of them does something funny, is that, like, become funnier to you all of a sudden? Like, are you valuing that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, are, you, are you finding nuances and value in places that you've been to before? It's already pretty funny when they're two years old. They kind of say some stuff. Yeah. Like <laughs> but uh, I think what it's caused me to do is I kept thinking I had to schedule, like every moment had to be super special and every moment had to be super exciting and basically no moments were occurring. Um, and so now what I've started doing is I schedule my happiness, that's what I say. Um, so I go on my calendar one month in advance and I schedule all the things I want to do. So I might just do one uh, week in a month where I spend it just with my kids and we go do some crazy thing and, and I or do something with my husband um, outside or take some time with my partner to my business partner and we go decompress and think about vision and things like that. So I schedule the things that give me passion and make me a better person. And I don't necessarily have to do it every day, which basically I wasn't accomplishing at all. Right. So, yeah. Okay, well, 
Okay, sorry, sorry, you're so deep about it, but I just, you know, I've been, I've been dealing with it, like, why are there so many mentors around here? I mean, this comes up, we have a few that are helping with Tiki Cake, but, like, they're volunteering their time, and they've made all this money and been so successful, so I, I, I'm just, I, I was a little bit shocked at how many people decided that, that what they actually liked doing was still the same thing they were doing, but without any money involved, and I just... So I think they would just want to give back, so from me, when I was a little kid, I had three teachers, and I can go back and tell you their names and the stories behind them, but at the end of the day, they made me feel like I was somebody. Yeah. And so what I try to do for my employees and, and people I mentor in the community and the young people I meet is I just hope to make them feel like somebody because somebody made me feel that. Right. So if I can just pass that along, that's what's made me successful. Ever my employees will tell you I don't think anything's impossible. And actually our IT director came the other day and was like, this this project's impossible. And I said it's not impossible. How much does it cost? And he said a million dollars. Like, that's not impossible. <laughs> yeah, right. so, so I don't I don't right, think absolutely. anything's impossible, and I think that that lesson came from people telling me there's nothing you can't do, and we just have some young people have been beat down quite a bit, and they just need someone to lift them just up and be like, spark. give them a chance, yeah. just a chance. Because yeah, I mean, it must, I mean, there must have been some little kindergarten Picasso, and he like drew a stick, <laughs> he drew a stick figure, and his yeah. teacher was like, oh, that's that's cool, stick figure, but and he's like, yeah, and he became Picasso. You know what I mean? Like something like that, guys. At the end of the guy. day, though, somebody sparks you, but you got to set the fire. Right. So you know, you can have all these mentors, and you can say you're building a business, but at the end of the day, you got to do it. Right. So I, I hate people who always say that they dream, I dreamed of this, I dreamed of that, and I'm like, okay, what are you gonna do tomorrow? About? Right. So, right. yeah. All right, so we're running out of time, but is there anything you want to tell everyone about? I mean, are you looking to hire anyone, or are you looking to get involved with like, investments, or? We're always looking to hire. We're always looking for really talented people. We're building our marketing department currently right now, looking for salespeople. Um, we're about to come online with a really exciting thing to a platform for our 40,000 people to buy alternative investments online, and it, that's my next level, even though Jason Griffith doesn't think so. so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's next level. All right, I know we didn't go into your company a ton, but I appreciate you coming and talking about what's going on inside your head. And everybody, follow her at uh, Provident IRA. So that's P-R-O-V-I-D-E-N-T, and then IRA on Twitter. And same thing, or trust Provident for the website, T-R-U-S-T-P-R-O-V-I-D-E-N-T.com. So thank you very much. We appreciate you coming out. I have Dylan here. Now, Dylan, what is your Twitter handle? Uh, Dylan Simpson. At Dylan Simpson. And Dylan Simpson, if you were to be in a band, what would your band be called? Oh, I don't know. Uh, the Dylans. I think we're going to get the three that are down here. And maybe because. Well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> he went prone. He went prone. Come on, cuz. <laughs> See? You cannot, you cannot for a group for a band. <laughs> he's on the team, I think he's on the team. And which band would you actually open for? Uh, probably one of the, uh, like Daft Punk or one of these uh, DJs because you don't have to do much work. We do all our pre-production and we'll go in and hit a button and we can party. <laughs> Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. Like a flashback, Vegas Tech, don't forget to spell it with the hashtag.